袋子，我出来吗？它变那么快，好像不会那么快，而且好像。看一下怎么。<咳>他的 screen share， 我没办法弄全屏幕。对。啊？啊有啊有位置啊。都可以做，都可以做。还不需要打屏幕。哦，好，那就介绍一下好，来来来，要开始了，等一下，等一下，三十秒，三十秒，对 ，OK， 等一下开始的时候，就先跟他讲一下，对，可以先讲一下，我再我再讲，后面后面，等一下，等一下，嗯，那讲，对，好。这样，对。<coughs> Hello, Kazin. Yeah. Uh, we 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 can start now, and I will briefly to introduce this talk and. Sure. Okay. 好，那欢迎大家来到今天那个 MLB 的房间。那我们今天的 talk 就是是由建群，然后帮我们邀请到 Google 的卡丁，然后来跟我们介绍那个。就是 data pipe， 就是 BigQuery、iPython 跟 Pandas 的一些应用。那就是那很很很感谢卡丁他就连线我们讲这个 talk。对对对，卡丁就是本来今天他是要来，但是因为他突然一定是有事，就其实生病，所以就是在新加坡跟我们做远端连线的。对对对，那他星期三的时候他会到台北 Docker 的 community 去去。另外一个 talk， 那如果大家要跟他面对面交谈的话，也可以选择新三区那个。他是 Google 在新加坡这边负责做云端方面的介绍，呃 ，U A 工程师呢非常非常的厉害。所以如果说大家有机会的话，可以在礼拜三的在 C L B T 也是七点的活动，大家可以去找卡蒂去聊这件事。反正我记得这个活动我已经报了，快差不多嘛。OK。OK。好 ，Thank you。No No。OK。OK。OK。Thank you。No worries. I'm just gonna go ahead and start presenting now. Okay. Uh, very good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Karthik. Um, uh, I'm happy to join you guys remotely from Singapore. Um, I wish I could be there, but due to some personal reasons, I have to do this over Hangout. But the next time I'm in, uh, next time you guys have a meetup, I promise to be there uh, in face and be talking to every one of you. So today we're going to take a quick look at what Google does uh, in the terms of putting out services out there which can work uh, with big data. And we will look at how all of that can integrate with different open source tools like IPython Notebook. We will look at how the, uh, we can integrate that with Pandas. Uh, which is the Python framework for uh, data frames, and it has a lot of um, uh, additional functionality in there. And finally, how we can, within the IPython context, uh, we can also see how we can integrate R into that mix and be able to do a whole bunch of different functions. Uh, <clears throat> this is primarily a R meetup, so I'm assuming that most of you are very, very familiar with R already. So now in this talk, what I'm going to focus primarily on is how do you bring the different components together <clears throat> and blend them in and use the power of Google's tools as well to do analysis at scale, right? So um, let's start off by talking a little bit about Google's own big data journey, right? Um, Google was doing big data before the term uh, became a very sexy marketing term. Every problem at Google um, when you think about it, it's really a big data problem. If somebody were to ask a question about AdWords and things like that and say, how did this AdWords perform here uh, within this time frame, 
you can think about it as having to process a couple of billion rows of data to answer that question. Everybody knows us from our search history and our search background. And uh, this box here needs no introduction, right? But to make this search platform work, behind it is a huge, complex, highly scalable cloud computing infrastructure, right? So this is one part of one data center that Google runs. And all of these fundamentally go to drive our search infrastructure, our uh, different products that we put out there, like Gmail, Maps, YouTube, etc. What we are doing with the Google Cloud Platform is taking all of these tools and putting it out there so that you can build your own applications on top of that. Right? Big data is what fuels Google as a company. Um, we need to be able to answer those questions at scale to be able to be successful as a company uh, and to be very successful within our uh, space of uh, ad-related uh, sales and so on. So along the way, Google has had to deal with different kinds of challenges uh, in dealing with data at scale. And we have had to innovate our way because every time we encountered one of these challenges, there wasn't a ready-made solution that was available, at least not for the scale at which that Google was handling these problems at. And we have had to innovate and drive technology forward to make it successful, right? So here is a timeline that you can take a look at. So back in 2002, when you're trying to index the web and store huge amounts of data, one of the key problems that we had to solve was how do you store these vast amounts of information in a distributed way and make sure that things are durable and resilient and you are able to handle this kind of data at scale. So for that, we came up with the Google file system that was back in 2002, which was a distributed uh, uh, file system. And then somewhere following that, we introduced the MapReduce framework, which could handle data parallel tasks on top of taking all of this enormous data and then running some uh, work on that. And then most of you are familiar with the MapReduce paradigm, where we take a complex problem, split large data problem, split it up into smaller chunks, over which we run one function which works on that partial data, generates some partial results which are uh, keyed uh, value pairs, and then we have a reduced phase where all of these are combined to produce the final result. So that was a paradigm that made it very, very easy to write uh, data parallel uh, algorithms, and uh, that's what we did. And then finally, we came up in 2002, uh, 2006 with a big table, which is basically a columnar storage model. And we put all of these things into production, and we were running them for a while. And then we wrote papers describing each and every one of these and put them out there. Now, these three core technologies have been taken up by the open source community, and they have become what we now call the Hadoop ecosystem, right? GFS inspired HDFS, MapReduce inspired the core Hadoop, and then HBase draws some of its inspiration from Bigtable as well, right? So this was back in 2006. So we found that MapReduce is a great paradigm for doing certain kind of tasks, but within Google, we needed to ask um, interactive queries of vast data sets in a uh, manner where the response comes back really, really quickly. Now, MapReduce is a great paradigm, but that's not necessarily designed for that kind of interactive data exploration. So we built another tool, uh, which we call Dremel. Um, so that's the tool uh, that takes a massive amounts of data and allows you to exploratorily interact with that data uh, over uh, very s simple RESTful API calls. And that tool we used internally for our own purposes is called Dremel. 
And what we are exposing today as BigQuery is basically Dremel, right? And there are some other innovations that we had. Colossus is an updated version of GFS uh, and so on. Spanner is an updated version uh, on the newer world iteration of BigTable and so on. So uh, that is our journey. So every single time we have encountered a problem, we have had to innovate our way out of it. And today what we're doing is exposing those innovations to you as a service. Sorry, clicked on the wrong direction. So this is where the Google Cloud Platform comes into play. Google Cloud Platform is taking all that stuff that makes Google Google and exposing them as consumable services that you can use to build your own applications. So when we expose them as services, we expose them in three different buckets. On, one, on the one side, we have the compute bucket, which has App Engine and Compute Engine. And uh, App Engine is our platform as a service offering. Compute Engine is our infrastructure as a service offering. And um, you could use either of those to handle the computation side of things. When you're trying to analyze huge amounts of data, you need to store data in different ways. And so we expose those uh, storage services under our storage services bucket. And we have three different kinds of storage offerings there. One is cloud storage, which is our object-based storage model, where you can store unlimited number of objects and up to 10 terabytes an object. All right. Uh, sorry, up to uh, 5 terabytes an object. Then we have Cloud SQL, which is our relational storage model, which is basically MySQL on the wire. And uh, we handle everything about HA and availability and making sure that the data is secured across multiple failure zones, et cetera, such that you just bring your schema and your data and everything else Google manages for you in a relational way. And finally, we have our NoSQL storage, which is Cloud Data Store, which is basically a massively scalable uh, key value type store. And it's a NoSQL storage model. And so if you have extremely light, heavy applications or you have some performance characteristics which are more uh, suited for a NoSQL model, then that's where you would use Cloud Data Store for. And finally, we have higher level services, which are BigQuery and Cloud Endpoints. Cloud Endpoints basically allows you to create multiple client app, uh, multi-client applications, whether it's Android, iOS, or uh, JavaScript on the web. Uh, you just write your server code once, and it's all part of App Engine, and then uh, you basically decorate or annotate that code, and we take that and automatically generate the client libraries for iOS, Android, and uh, uh, JavaScript. Right? But the BigQuery is basically Dremel exposed as a service, right? So BigQuery is Google's own analytics tools, which you're going to expose to you. And so you bring your data in row column format in CSV or JSON, and once we ingest that data in, you could go ahead and start writing those, uh, uh, start interrogating the data in SQL-like language, and you can start um, exploring your data right away and start getting answers right away, right? So I'll just do a first demo, which is a quick walkthrough of the cloud platform, and then we'll start digging into more details around BigQuery, and then we'll start getting into more and more um, uh, deeper into how we'll integrate that with Python, Pandas, and so on. So the story all begins at cloud.google.com. Um, maybe I should go to the uh, cloud.google.com first. Right? So this is where the story all begins. So if you have a Google account, you can go ahead and sign in here. And uh, you can create your own projects. Uh, projects are where you group all the services that you put uh, consume. And if I go to my cloud console here, uh, you can see that I have two different projects. One is a demo project, and one is another project, which is like a my project and so on, right? And uh, if I click on the demo project here, um, on the left-hand pane here, I see all of the different services that I want to use and consume. And um, I have some project-related settings. So if I go to the permissions tab on my project here, I can add multiple people to this project. Right now, I'm just, just me. If I wanted to add somebody else to work with me on this project, I can just click 
uh, add member, I can give their email address, and I can say what kind of permissions they I want to allow them on this project, whether they're an owner, whether they just can edit the project settings, or whether they're able to just view the products, project settings and not able to edit anything and so on. Right, So I can have multiple collaborators on this one. And I also have all the different APIs that Google provides under the APIs and authorizations tab. Uh, for our demonstration here, I've turned down the BigQuery API already. But every one of the Google APIs is available here for you to turn on. Right. Uh, so if you are doing some work where you're trying to use ads, uh, uh, Google ad, uh, ads and its data, you can turn on those APIs here. If you have Google Analytics, you can turn on those Google Analytics API, etc. Right. But the key here is around these three different buckets here: the computation, the storage, and the big data bucket. So if I go to my compute bucket, remember I told you that there are two different kinds of compute services, App Engine and Compute Engine. Those turn up on the left-hand pane here. So if I click on Compute Engine here, um, basically these are virtual machines in the cloud that you can provision in any way, shape, or form that you want. So if I wanted to create a new machine to do my processing, uh, so I could just create a new machine here. I can choose what kind of machine I want. I can say which zone I want to spin this machine up in. Uh, so as you can see, we have three zones in Asia. Asia East one is actually Taipei, uh, in, uh, sorry, in Taiwan. So uh, if you chose an Asia East one machine, all of the uh, data that is attached to that virtual machine will actually be in, in Taiwan, and you'll get uh, extremely low latency to your services. But at the same time, I can spin up a machine in Europe. I can spin up a machine in uh, the US. Uh, as I like, right? So maybe I'll just choose uh, Asia East 1C. Then I can choose what kind of machine I want in there. So I can choose number uh, N1 standard 2. I can choose what kind of operating system I want. Let's say I choose, I don't know, CentOS on this one. And I can have multiple kinds of disks attached to this. A standard persistent disk, or I can put an uh, SSD persistent disk, etc. And then when I hit Create, um, it's go, going to go off and spin a virtual machine for me. Now, why is this important, right? Um, when you're trying to do a lot of analysis in parallel, we're not going to cover Hadoop, etc., in too much detail today, but the ability for you to spin up a large cluster of machines really quickly to run analysis on that. I don't know how many of you have been using R along with Hadoop. Uh, there are quite a few packages that do that as well. So uh, if if you using those kind of packages, then being able to spin up machines really, really quickly and being able to do your analysis and then being able to shut that down really makes a big difference. So I've spun up this machine here. So if I click on this button, which says SSH, um, I think you cannot see that button here. So let me just go ahead and share the whole screen so that you can see it. So let me just close this window here, leave this page. So when I created my instance, there's a button here I can connect to by just clicking on that. And it will create an in-browser SSH session for me. It works perfectly fine on Chrome. So it will go ahead and connect to that instance. And then basically I have an SSH instance running there. And I can start making whatever uh, connections I want to that machine and so on. Let me just expand this to make sure that you can see it a little bit better. Um, okay. So can you see that instance over there? Yeah. Okay. So I'm on an SSH instance here, so I basically can uh, list and I, I basically have access to that machine and I can do whatever else I want in here, right? So if I want to install R in here, I can just do uh, sudo apt-get um, R core or R base. Uh, sorry, Kazi. Like, yeah. uh, could you uh, state the share full screen and then we can see it clearly? Yeah, maybe need a bigger. Oh, okay. So let me just try and make that bigger. 
Um, Is it is that big enough or is it still not big enough? Yeah, it's is big about it. The word can see it. The word is a little small. Ah, I see. But I I still can see the comment you type, but okay. other people cannot see. I see. Um, okay, what I will do is I'll just so this is from the uh, window itself. You can uh, connect into this one. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just uh, try and see if I can zoom in. Uh, view zoom in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, zoom in again. <laughs> yeah, I'll zoom in one more time. Is it bigger? Yeah. Okay. That's even better? Yeah, it's better. Right, so I'm inside this machine here, so I can do whatever I want. So if I do sudo apt get updates, I'm just going to go, uh, sorry, this is uh, uh, yum update. So this is a SanOS machine, sorry. Uh, so let's sudo yum update, right? So it's going to update yum for me, and then if I wanted to install something on the SanOS machine, I just do yum install rbase. It'll go ahead and install everything R related for me and so on. So I can spin up a large cluster really, really quickly. And uh, I can go ahead and modify anything I want in here. So that was a quick run over through of what Compute Engine is. Now let's go back. And at, at the console here, on the storage side, I have Cloud Storage, Cloud Data Store, and Cloud SQL. And on the BigQuery side, I have BigQuery here as well, right? So let me just go ahead and go back to the slide. So that was a quick overview of the platform. So as I said, we have computation. Uh, so there's App Engine and Compute Engine. We have storage. We have multiple ways of storing data. And you have app services with, and cloud endpoints. So I just want to give you a quick walkthrough before we get specific into the big data model, right? So the key drivers that are there for big data is around data availability, the ability to process huge amounts of new information, and the fact that now you can go ahead and consume this in a cloud model without having to have any predefined cost. That just lowers the cost of experimentation. And you can run any kind of data experiment that you like. And using cloud platform technologies, you can combine open source and any platform services that Google will provide. So using that BigQuery plus cloud platform storage and any open source stuff that you could have on big data. And by open source, I mean Hadoop, I mean uh, Hive, Pig, whatever else you like. You have an integrated data processing platform. BigQuery directly talks to uh, storage services. Any of the open source stuff you uh, run could also directly speak to the cloud platform storage services from Compute Engine. You have an integrated platform which can mix all of these together. So let's now look at the key one. Yeah, so uh, can I continue? Uh, can you guys still hear me? Okay, okay. It's okay. All right. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. So I'll just continue on. I'll show you the basics of BigQuery now. So all of those were about storing data, putting data in here. So the key tool that we want to look into in a bit more detail today is BigQuery, right? So the way Big you get access to BigQuery is you come back to your cloud console, you click on the BigQuery button, it goes and launches the BigQuery console, right? So along here in the BigQuery, I can create a new data set. Um, so for example, so BigQuery works through data sets and tables. A data set is a collection of uh, tables. So I can say create a new data set, uh, R meetup uh, data set. Right. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So it 
we can do the R Meetup data set over here. I click OK on that, so it's going to create a new data set for me, which is a collection of, like I said, tables. There is no table in there. So if I want to bring in a table, so I'm just doing this through the console, but you can do this through the command line. You can specify enormous amounts of data as you like. But I'm just going to go ahead and bring in some sample data, right? So um, let's say this is called, uh, let me just open up my command line here. Uh, CD desktop. Uh, uh, sorry, you, you, you need to do zoom in. Yeah, yeah, I'll zoom in just one second. I just wanted to change the directory first. Right? Yeah. So let me just do clear. And if I do LS, I have a whole bunch of uh, data here where each file is for one year. So if I just do head, uh, let's say 2010, uh, yob2010.txt. So there is three pieces of data. There's multiple lines in there, but you have a name whether that name is a female or a male, and the mm. number of times that name. Sorry, 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 Kate. Uh, could you zoom in twice? Zoom in some more? Uh, no, 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 twice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's better. Yeah, it's better. Yeah. So I just did a head on year of birth 2010, and every line in here contains three values. The first value is a string value, which is a name. The second one is whether it's male or female. The third one is a number. So these are basically data sets of what names have been given to children in that year. So for example, the name Isabella was given to a girl, and it was given 22,872 times in the year 2010. Right. So we have multiple pieces of data like that. So what we are going to do is basically upload one of these into BigQuery uh, using the console. So if I go back to BigQuery here and I say names 2010, so we're creating a new table. Now we need to select the data that we want to bring in. So I, it's CSV data. I'm going to choose to upload the file, but I can also bring the data from cloud storage. So I'll choose to upload the file, and I'll go to my directory here, which is names, and let's say uh, year of birth 2010. Let me just open that. So I've chosen the file. The next thing I have to specify is the schema. So I'll say name string. Uh, uh, um, gender is also string. And uh, hotel times or maybe I'll say uh, number of times uh, is a integer, right? So that's a string which is specifying those three values here, which is basically uh, the fact that it's a name, the fact that it's a female, so that's also a string, and the number of times it's happened, number of times that name was given, right? So I click Next, and it gives me some advanced options, etc. I can just go ahead and submit that. So now what's going to happen is that basically we're going to go ahead, get that piece of data, try and bring that into a table within BigQuery. So if I go to jobs, so basically we have started a new job, and that job is trying to upload the file uh, names 2010 to this data set. So if I click on that, it says uploaded the thing. It's going ahead and doing the load now, right? So if I give it a couple of more seconds, so as you can see, the names is now loading. And if I just refresh my screen here, so it's completely loaded the file. So if I go to my names data set now, I have a table where there's a name, a uh, gender, and the so, number of times. Sorry, can take. Uh, could you also bring in the web? Yeah, 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 web browser. Thank you, thank you. No worries. So I uploaded in there. So I have a names 2010 table. I have a name, a gender, a number of times. And if I go ahead and query that table, now I'm just using plain old SQL statements to yeah. query against this table. So if I do count star as total from names, uh, and I want to get the total number of rows in there, and if I just go and query that, 
Uh, so there are about 34,000 uh, lines in there. Let's say uh, we want to get um, the largest. So if you look at it, the number of times. So let's say we'll get the uh, name, comma, number. So I can also tap. If I uh, tab, it'll do auto complete from there, right? And then I'm going to take those two ones, and then I'm going to get order by uh, number uh, of times. So let me just do order by number of times, uh, and I want to do descending and give it the top 100, right? So I'm going to get the inverse relationship. So, uh, sorry, I'm going to get the top 100 names uh, for that year, and I'm going to sort them by the number of times that name happened, right? So if I just run that query, so the number of times, if you see Isabella is the highest one, and Jacob is the second highest one. So if I just say uh, gender, Let's choose the gender as well, and let's find out what was the uh, largest uh, name there. So let's say where uh, gender equals male. Sorry. So I'm now going to filter by saying, give me only those top 100 boys names for the year from that data set. If I run that query now, and the result is Jacob, right? So you get the picture. Uh, I think this probably has something to do with the uh, Twilight movie series, but I don't know, right? So you get the idea. So you, BigQuery is basically a massive uh, uh, query engine on a data set. And there, this is a very simple process that I showed you to upload some data here. But we have already put some public data set samples together, which are pretty big. So here is like the Wikipedia data set, right? And if you look at the Wikipedia data set, so this is time every time there is an entry or a modification on Wikipedia, uh, a draw is put into that data set. So if I just query that. Uh, and let's see how many rows we have in there. Uh, and if I run that query, so it has roughly 300 million rows in there. Uh, but the system basically blazed through that and gave me an answer in like effectively uh, 3.7 seconds. So if I do, um, let's choose the uh, title. So Total and title is a field in there, right? Uh, from Wikipedia, where title contains, I don't know, we'll just say meetup. Um, group each by title, order each by total. I think it's total or totals? Yeah, total. Um, descending, and then if I run that query, so now I'm asking to go through the Wikipedia data set, which is 300 plus million rows. So the Wikipedia article, which has the maximum number of entries for uh, with the word meetup, is basically meetup past meetups group. And the second one is wiki meetup. And then there is a category Wikipedia meetups, et cetera. Right? So if I just replace this for maybe with Taipei and see which one has Taipei in there. Right, so uh, Rocco Porus type in it. I have no idea what that is, but, <laughs> but you get the idea, right? So, irrespective of the number of rows that are in the data set, we have a query processing engine with an extremely scalable storage which can give you answers in really, really quick time. Now, we want to then go back. Let me get back to the slides here because that was just to give you a BigQuery basics. Um, so we want to now take that engine and marry that uh, along with uh, our R and Python and so on and so forth. So 
we have been innovating on BigQuery a lot. We introduced an external connector. We introduced JSON import. Uh, we are allowed you to do big joins. We have added analytic functions in there. We have some functions which can do um, you know things like uh, mean and standard deviation and so on and so forth. It's not as exhaustive as R, but if you're just doing some basic stuff, it'll probably get it done uh, within BigQuery itself. And then we introduce streaming API and we introduce analytics integration and so on. And uh, we have been constantly innovating on that engine, right? So how does that BigQuery actually work underneath the covers? Um, firstly, BigQuery is a column-oriented storage, right? In a traditional database, you store data in rows, right? So you store them in records. In a column-oriented storage, you store them in columns. So each of those database files contains one column. Now, the advantage of that is primarily that uh, you could uh, fundamentally do better compression because all of the data in one column usually belongs to the same type, right? So that allows uh, an, a huge amount of compression, which you couldn't do if you mix different data together. You could do some compression, but obviously when it's all the same type, you have opportunities for better compression, right? And secondly, when you write the query, like the query that I wrote, and I said, bring me the title, uh, etc. In that case, it doesn't have to read the whole row. It just needs to read that one column. So for the classic uh, BI type warehouse uh, exploratory data analysis type questions uh, where you're basically filtering on some parameters, grouping by some other parameters, and ordering by something else, this kind of column-oriented storage makes it very, very efficient because you could go ahead and read only that which is required and not have to read the intermediate ones. Whereas if you had a record-oriented storage, you'd be reading all of that. The second thing is that uh, we have a hierarchical serving tree architecture. So uh, what we have done is achieve massive amounts of parallelization. So your query comes in at the top. It gets split into subqueries. Subqueries get split even further. And finally, Every, uh, the leaf nodes are basically reading from the columnar storage, right? So only the leaf nodes are actually reading data in parallel from the distributed storage. So uh, we do a lot of magic underneath the covers so that we can basically co uh, parallelize this across multiple nodes, etc. So uh, that makes things really, really fast. So uh, as the queries uh, get split further down, you could have a thousand threads at the leaf node basically reading data in parallel. But only the leaf nodes are basically reading from the storage. Each of them do a partial reduction of the data and send the data upwards. The mixers then blend those data together and they send it upwards and so on. So at each level, they are aggregating the results from, sorry, unionizing the results from below and all the way to the top. Right? So that way, uh, you get very, very good performance, and the intermediate layers do not even touch storage. So you take advantage of parallelization in the initial uh, uh, reads as well from the columnar storage, but at the same time, the intermediate uh, nodes don't have to touch the data as well. It's completely a diskless data flow. So let's take a simple question here. Uh, for example, I'm saying select. So I'm, in this case, I'm using the public data sample that we have provided, which is the natality data set. Natality data set basically contains uh, a list of all the births that have been happening, and it's a publicly available data set. And it has different characteristics inside the data set, like what is the state. So this is from the United States. So it gives you which state uh, that birth happened, what was the birth weight of the child? Uh, was the mother a smoker? Was the father a smoker? Et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to read uh, the state. Uh, so we're going to ask the question of this data set is, in this decade, give me the test, uh, give me the 10 states with the highest number of babies that were born. So the query to answer that is, select the state, count the number of babies from the public data set 
this is the public data set, where the year parameter was in this decade, then we group by the state, and then we order by the number of babies in a descending, and we limit to the top 10, right? So when that query actually gets executed, at the bottom level, the leaf nodes basically read the state and the year, because those are, if you look at the query here, the year column is required, and the state column is required to answer this question. So they just basically read the state and the year from the uh, leaf nodes, and then they do a, 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 a count and a group by and apply the filter, right? So you get something of the order of 140 million rows reduced to an order of 50 states, and those partial results are sent up where they're again combined together, and finally at the top level, you get the top 10, and then you show the results. Right, so that's how it works underneath the hood, and that's why BigQuery is really, really fast. Right, so let's go ahead and uh, take a look at uh, BigQuery in a bit more detail now. So I go back in here. So I have multiple different uh, data sets here. So here I have um, the natality data set we just spoke about. Right, so here is the uh, the day the month, the year in which the child was born, is the child a male, what is the race of the child, what is the weight in pounds, uh, etc. where was the mother uh, born, uh, sorry, what is the mother's resident state, race, age, etc. and if the mother or a father is a smoker, uh, do they drink, etc. So there are lots of fields in here as you can see, but for our query, basically we just wanted to look at the top 10 states, so all we did was that, right? So let me just go ahead and copy and paste that query for you and show you running, show it to you running over here. So, but we'll just first uh, choose, uh, sorry. Uh, okay, so let's just look at the size of the data. If I just run that, so that has something of the order of 140 million rows, right? So let's go ahead and run that query. So we're going to count state, count babies, where it's not decade, order by, and run. So if I run this query now, that query basically took about 2.5 seconds and to run, and the maximum number of children that are born where in California for that decade, the next was Texas, followed by New York, then Illinois, etc. Right? So that works fundamentally in this structure, right? So uh, the query reached the leaf nodes, where we read all of that, the state and the year, we did a count, and all of this process just took 2.5 seconds to execute, right? And we had to process every single row. There are no indexes in BigQuery. And it's very hard to create indexes if you don't know what questions you're asking of the data. So we had to go through all 130 million rows to answer that question. And uh, for those, each of those rows, we pulled out the state column and the uh, year column to answer that question. Right. So now, so we have established uh, BigQuery as a framework. Now let's go ahead and see how BigQuery can be integrated into tools like IPython and everything else to make this whole thing work, right? So within the Google Cloud platform, uh, we have this notion of a service account. So we're going to spin up an instance where we'll enable the service account and it'll allow it to have direct uh, BigQuery integration. And then we'll go ahead and install the IPython notebook in that system. And what we, as you've seen, BigQuery is extremely, extremely powerful in acting as a huge uh, data base for interactive query analysis. So we'll use BigQuery as that background. And then we'll go ahead and uh, interrogate that data using our BigQuery client. So how do we go about doing that? So first, we go into uh, our compute instances here. So I basically will spin up a new instance. Like right? let's call it instance two. Uh, let's say it's running in East One C, right? 
and etc etc and if I show my advanced options here uh, I have enabled the Google BigQuery service account and I can enable what is called uh, uh, BigQuery integration so in other words this compute engine instance is going to be able to connect directly to BigQuery and have a high-speed path straight into BigQuery, right? Because all of these services are co-located and they can take advantage of the fact that they're all based on the same uh, infrastructure. So once I do that and I hit create, I'll get a new machine. So let me choose the Debian um, Backports VZ image. Let's choose that. And when I hit the create button, it will go ahead and create a new uh, instance for me. But I already spun up one instance here. Uh, so I spun up one instance for IPython. So I'm just going to go ahead and directly check your shell into that instance. And let's make this wait a couple of seconds. And let's make it bigger uh, once it's gone into the system. So it's basically connecting to that virtual machine. right? It's just transferring the SSH keys to that machine. It's establishing the connection to that server. Uh, just give it a couple of seconds here, right? So is that big enough, or do you want me to make it bigger? Yeah, it's big enough. It's big enough, right? Yeah. Uh, so now what I have done inside this machine is already install um, IPython, right? So I have already have user local bin. I've installed IPython already, and I've already configured this machine to be a service account with BigQuery integration enabled. So I'll go ahead and start my IPython notebook here. And I'll start them. Uh, I'm assuming most of you are familiar with IPython. Is that a fair assumption? Well, let's just assume. Yeah. So IPython is a good way of going about it. So I'm just going to go ahead and start it. Obviously, I haven't done stuff like I haven't set up a username and password. And I'm not running it in second mode, but this is just a demonstration, so it's OK. So once I have done that, I can now go into uh, this particular IP address over here, which is the external IP address of that machine. So let's do that. And I'll just paste that. And let's uh, connect into port number 8080, right? So. Once I have done that, effectively what I have here is an IPython notebook uh, server running. And for me to be able to connect on port 8080, I basically needed to set up some firewall rules uh, inside the network's configuration here. Uh, I basically told the system uh, to allow uh, TCP port 8080, and I tagged the HTTP server that I'm just using to allow that kind of uh, in, uh, inbound traffic. So once this is running, right, what I have to do next is basically uh, go ahead and start connecting in with, in, into this with BigQuery. So let's go ahead and create a new notebook. right? So once I'm in IPython, I can just go ahead and do import pandas as pd. I can import numpy. Right? So I'll go ahead and execute that. Right? And I can start doing some, uh, sorry, import uh, matplotlib. Um, um, so, and then I do person matplotlib uh, inline so that we get the displays inline as well. Uh, do you want this to be made bigger as well? Is this big enough? Yeah, it's, it's big enough. OK, I can make it a little bigger if you like. Is that better? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's big enough. OK, is it good enough? Yeah, yes. OK, so I mean, now I have pandas running. I can set up some um, you know, data sets in pandas. So let's say I want to do uh, stuff like set up uh, two series of data. Uh, and then I can go ahead and do whatever else I want. For example, uh, I, I love stinky tofu a lot. So let's say tofu. Uh, Taste, or rather, uh, tofu smell is probably a PD dot series, uh, and maybe this is uh, individual values that I put here. So let's say one, two, three, four, five, uh, six, 
and that's basically that. Then I say Karthik uh, loves is equal to PD dot series as well. And I love it. I love it a lot. So let's say it's 10, 11, uh, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Right? Uh, sorry, maybe 15, right? So once I've done this, I can just do usual stuff uh, that I can do in uh, Matplot, uh, using matplotlib and IPython notebook, so which is that I can do tofu underscore smell that plot, and I can do um, karthik underscore loves dot plot, and then I can just go ahead and run that, and I should get... Uh, Visualization. So you can see there's a very linear correlation. So this is just some stuff that I made up. But the key here is that once I have this setup up and running, I can go ahead and now start to link into BigQuery. So I just do import BigQ, which is a Python library. And I can say import uh, date time. And I import pandas, which I already done. Sorry, I don't think that's required. Oh, maybe I can, so it doesn't matter. right? And then I want to create a BigQuery client is equal to bq uh, dot client dot get. So what I'm doing here is basically importing the BigQuery library, importing the datetime library, importing pandas, and I'm creating a BigQuery client. So if I just go ahead and run that, right? So it's now created a client. So now I can just go ahead and query any query that I write, which would I would have written over here. I can write that same query within this interface, right? So let me just copy this out. I can go back here. I can say demo query equals, right? And let's say I uh, drop that text here, right? Uh, select state from this, from uh, blah, blah, blah. And let's say. Right, so I have created a query string, which is my demo query, right? And now I can go ahead and get the data out from running that query, right? So I get it as a uh, tuple. So let's run that query against that client. Client uh, dot read uh, schema and rows of um, client dot query of uh, demo query, right? And I can just go ahead and ask it to give me the configuration, which is one of the things that comes out. And then um, it's the query. And um, I can also say what the destination. Uh, oh, you are missing a uh, 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 right. Got it. Yeah. Uh, and I can say, give me the maximum number of rows. It's maybe a thousand or a hundred, right? So I could just go ahead and run that query. Uh, let me just check the syntax. Here. So basically, I've created a client, and I'm saying, read this schema and the rows by going ahead and executing my demo query that I just made here, and give me back. Uh, about a hundred rows of that data, right? So if I just go ahead and run this one, right? So it's going to go ahead and do that. And uh, let's say, so it's waiting on that job to be done. Sorry. So if I do data of, let's say, let's get the top 20 rows over there. And Execute that. So there you go, right? So it gives me the top 20 rows there, which is California, Texas, New York, Illinois, I think this is Pennsylvania, Ohio, Florida, Michigan, New Jersey, New York. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't know which more which place that NC is. But you get the idea. Now I can start ahead, do whatever I want by just going ahead and um, interacting with this data set in any way, shape, or form that I want to do. Uh, any questions on this one so far? OK, no question. So I can go ahead and start asking any kind of complex question that I want and plot that 
and use IPython to do interactive analysis of that as well. And uh, there will be no uh, real uh, performance issues or stuff like that because essentially BigQuery is the query engine which is providing result sets. So you could maybe have a really massive data set in the back, but you could write a query, take out some part of it, run some interactive analysis with it, and so on. And that that makes a huge, huge difference, right? So I have another data set that I have, which is basically the uh, departure flight delay and departure uh, arrivals and departures. Let's see if we can find that data set here. Here we go. So here is an airline uh, data set that I have. Uh, so basically, this is all about uh, flights that have left uh, the different airports. So there is an airline. There is a departure airport code. There is a departure airport state. There is a latitude, longitude, which is the arrival. So where was the thing headed for? And what is the departure schedule? Was there a departure delay? So the delay says if that particular flight was uh, scheduled and how long did it take to departure, was there an arrival delay, was it departure delay, et cetera, et cetera, right? So I want to go ahead and ask this question. Uh, give me, um, let me just uh, put that question here. Uh, where are we? So here we go. So I'm writing a query now, which is going to select the date, departure state, the average of the departure delay from that data set for New York and uh, wherever uh, the date and the departure, uh, you want to group that by the date and the departure state uh, where you basically had the number of counts greater than five and you want to order by the date, right? So then you want to then go ahead and plot that out using uh, the IPython notebook and show a display of that. So let's go ahead and execute that. So it's basically waiting on the BigQuery to run. And here is a nice little plot using matplotlib where the x-axis is basically the, uh, the date and the y-axis is basically the delay or the average delay of the departure of a flight out of New York. So as you can see, there are some patterns that we can see here. Uh, it seems like every time when we get to the end of the year, there's a massive spike in the delays, which is kind of to be expected, right? Because uh, you are looking at um, uh, delays due to uh, Christmas and so on, where a lot of people are trying to get home, and so you have different kinds of issues and so on. Um, but this is interesting, but there's a lot of data here, right? So it's hard to make out much. Maybe we want to plot that data out by different months, right? So we will just go ahead and try and do that, which is we will run another query. So get that same query. And uh, this time around, uh, so we're going to aggregate the data. So what we're going to do is uh, get the data put them on different um, months, and then go ahead and run that query and see how all of that works out. So once again, we're just going to run that query for you. It's going ahead. Now it's a little more clearer, right? So we've just gone ahead and done that same thing, except we've done a group by um, of the departure date and the departure state. Again, the same kind of uh, things, but we're just plotting it out in a little more easier fashion by aggregating some of the stuff. And it works really, really well. Now, we can run other queries. So often at times, we want to be able to compare different pieces of data sets. So New York is one city in that data set. We want to compare New York and see if New York's uh, departure, delivery, or arrival times are in any way correlated to that of a nearby uh, station, right? So. That's a question you might ask where the hypothesis maybe is that fundamentally most of the delays are maybe weather related or what have you, right? And so to do that, we will write another query, right? So here is another query we're going to write. And uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, run that query. So let's just go ahead and do that. So let me just put that query here. 
So now we're going to do a join. So we're going to choose uh, all of the departure state, uh, all of the pieces of data, the same kind of query as before, where the departure state is New York, and we're going to do the same thing where all of the uh, departure states is New Jersey. We're going to put those two together, right? And then we're going to go ahead and uh, stick it into a data frame, right? So if I just run that and uh, let me just paste this one here. So then we're going to just stick all of that data into a data frame. And we're going to go ahead and plot it out as well. So the same query as before, except now I'm trying to do a join between two different states and make sh see if there is any interesting pattern that we can find out of that. So we'll go ahead and do that. And I'm going to run this again. So it's going ahead and executing the job on BigQuery. And as you can see, those are pretty well correlated, right? So um, a delay in New York usually means a delay in New Jersey as well. And you can see some reasonably good correlation across those two different things. And so that these are different ways you can experiment uh, with BigQuery and integrate that with Pandas and you know play around with your data in any way, shape, or form that you want to understand how all of these things work in different ways. The key advantage here is that BigQuery is like this huge, really fast query engine, which goes ahead and does a bunch of the work for you. And uh, you just basically then use that results within IPython, and you can start playing around with the data any way, shape, or form that you like. Right? So maybe I'll just go ahead and create a new notebook. Because what we have done recently, so what you've seen here is an interesting uh, piece of integration, right? So we're creating a BigQuery client, etc. But as of Pandas, uh, I think it's 0 0.31, we also introduced uh, a in, uh, library into Pandas, which folk, uh, while it was done as an open source project by uh, some people outside of Google, but um, we have introduced uh, BigQuery as an I.O. option into Pandas as well. So I'm just going to go ahead and import that again, just to show you. Import matplotlib, uh, right? And let me just set person matplotlib in line so that you actually get to see stuff. So I've gone ahead and integrated that, right? So let's go ahead and prick another uh, data set. So maybe we'll go ahead and see what other data sets we have here. Uh, uh, OK, well, let's have a look at the weather data set. And maybe we want to query the weather data set. right? So in the weather data set, you have different kinds of uh, daily weather, the station number, the year, the mean temperature, mean number of temperature samples, etc. So maybe I'll just take an average of the uh, mean. Uh, so when I do a tab, it auto-completes for me as average uh, yearly uh, temperature, right? Um, and then we'll choose the year as well, right? We'll choose those two from uh, the query. And uh, we'll see uh, group, group the data, group each by year. Uh, and then uh, we'll probably order each by the year as well. And we'll put it in a descending order. So look at the data set. Go ahead and um, get all of the average yearly temperatures uh, from the uh, weather data set. And then uh, order each by the year in a descending fashion. So here we go. So what we have done here is basically run a statistical function we have, which is average. And we're taking the mean temperature column, so which is a daily uh, mean temperature. And we're getting it as an average yearly temperature. So you can see all of the different dates and what was the average um, mean temperature for that year and so on. Now, I want to run this query uh, within the new uh, Pandas uh, IO module that we have. So I'm just going to go ahead as before, uh, create a query string equals, 
right? And I put that in, and sorry, uh, let me just go ahead and do that. Uh, here we go. Query string, and get to the end of that. So I'm just copying and pasting that query that I just did. Right, so let's go ahead and run that. So I have my query string ready to go. So now I can just basically <coughs> use create a data frame in Pandas, except now this time I will use the GBQ uh, library that we have built, uh, that has been put together for Pandas uh, uh, itself. So I can just do that. So I'm using the pandas.io. So you need to be in version 0.31 of pandas to get this particular function. So if I just go ahead and write that now and execute that. So basically, that query executed in about 2.8 seconds, and it uh, it got the results back. So if I wanted to look at the results, maybe I can just do D frame up to 10, get the 10 results out there. I hit play, and there you go, right? So I'm getting the top 10 uh, results of so from 2011 all the way up to 2002. What was the average yearly temperature that comes out, right? So now I have this as a completely as an iPandas data frame. Now with the use of uh, in a library called RPy2, I can start uh, doing R stuff as well. So I can just basically import a library called RPy2, and I can do import star from there, and I can import the pandas conversion library, so rpy.common, that's com. So, right, so I'm going to go ahead and import this. So RPy2 is a higher level library which underneath the covers can work with R, right? So I'm integrating those two. And now I can basically take that data frame from um, uh, pandas and convert that to R, right? So if I do a convert to R data frame of uh, what was my data frame before, I called it D frame, right? So now I get back an R data frame, and now I can basically start doing everything I want to do uh, using rpy2 and start issuing r commands in here. So I can just basically import um, uh, uh, let's go ahead and import the r objects right and then I can do r test is equal to r objects dot r sorry hold on right and so I've just basically created a handle. And now I can go ahead and start doing all kinds of stuff with that. So if I want to see what the data frame is all about, so I can just do our data frame. So now we have a data frame which is in our format. And then I can basically ask all kinds of questions of that. So if I do our test dot, say, a typical R function, which is a number of rows on that R data frame, and hit go. So it basically says uh, there are 82 rows in there. And if I do, say, r dot, uh, let's say, I don't know, let's do something like a very simple one. So r test dot mean of that r data frame, right? And hit go. It basically goes ahead and computes that. So it's 51, and you know the mean year is 1970. That's not very meaningful. But that's the mean. So you get the idea. So now I can basically use BigQuery as like a massive backend database by which I can go ahead and write any kind of queries that I like, get some data out that I'm of interest to me, and then use IPython with R and RP2, RPy2, and just mash up the data in any way, shape, or form. And the fact that you already have a pandas. Uh, I/O module for BigQuery makes this whole process that much simpler, right? So that makes everything so much easier to do, and you can now blend R. Uh, Python is a wonderful language to blend all of these different packages together. Uh, I use it a lot, 
and I can blend it up with uh, uh, if I wanted to use R's plotting capabilities I just import uh, ggplot2 and then I can do whatever else I want within that as well. Uh, if I wanted to use some uh, network uh, structures I import the network libraries and off I go right so it, it's a great place to bring all of these together and at the same time you have the power of BigQuery and all of its massive data in the background for you to do whatever you want to do without worrying about the size of your data set. I have customers in the gaming sector who are looking to upload something of the order of 100 GB of data every day into BigQuery. And then they just analyze and slice and dice it and use whatever tools they want to go ahead and look at the data in different shapes and formats, right? So let's keep going here. So that was a quick overview. Uh, if you want to install R itself, uh, we have a tool called Deployment Manager, uh, which allows you to install uh, and you know, create templates of servers and install um, any number of those that you uh, in, in in a very easy to do way. So I highly recommend you go out and check uh, the deployment manager tool as well. And if you want to build large clusters of R running along with Hadoop, uh, that would be a good tool to use as well. Uh, so I just what I spoke about. So the I, in the interest of time, so I'll go ahead and talk about the cloud data flow, right? So that was a quick overview of how what BigQuery is, how you can marry uh, IPython notebooks with Pandas, with R, and use them all to do any kind of queries that you like. BigQuery is actually, actually very, very cheap. Uh, we charge you uh, 2.6 cents per GB of storage of data, and you can uh, basically... Uh, Query any number of times that you like, and we charge you five dollars per terabyte of query processing. Right, so uh, you can have massive terabytes of data. So you say if you have a ten terabyte data set, you only pay something like two fifty dollars a month for the storage. And how, depending on how you access the data, you just pay for the queries and so on. And that's an extremely flexible model where you don't have to worry about any of the underlying architecture around storage, queries, et cetera, all of those, those happens, and then you can blend it up with any kind of data analysis tool you want to talk. Now, at IO this year, we talked about cloud data flow, which is a newer higher level service for data analytics that Google is putting together. This particular tool is currently under private beta, so uh, just Google for the form and if you're interested in it, just fill in that form and we will let you know if you can access that. But it's, it's coming pretty soon. And what that does is basically, whenever we talk about data pro processing, people think about it, of data promise processing in different stages, right? So for example, if you want to write a data processing uh, pipeline uh, that is done doing analysis of Twitter feeds, right? So the tweets come in on the top. You want to read the tweets. Maybe you want to extract the hashtags. You want to do some count around that. Maybe expand some of the prefixes and maybe try and get the top three. And you can write to that and then you can use that to do some predictions, etc. So this is a step-by-step a, a -step funnel through which data is coming in in, in real-time mode. And you want to be able to analyze that as and when it happens. So what we are putting together in Cloud Dataflow is that we, we have just released another uh, feature called Publish and Subscribe, which can act as a source and sync for data. So you can have all of these different tweets, etc., coming in uh, through a, a, a PubSub uh, endpoint. And we do all of that processing and publish the results out in another PubSub endpoint. So what you do is you describe each of these stages as a simple code using our APIs. And what Google will do underneath the covers is take all of that code and automatically do parallelization for you. So you could describe a, a linear flow like that and we will underneath the covers figure out how things need to be parallelized and just go ahead and do them for you. 
here is a simple example, right? So here is a very simple pipeline that we have created here. Pipeline is equal to pipeline.create. And we have a begin command. Then we say apply, uh, read some text data from a storage bucket. And there are some interesting keywords here like par do, which is basically parallel do of a function. Right? In this case, the function is extract tags. Then we do a count. And then we have another parallel do of another function we are asking here, which is expand prefix. So by the way, this is all user-defined functions that you're giving. And par do is basically a construct that we provide for you. And once you have written that code, automatically Google will figure out how best to parallelize this, run that on top of computer engine, and then give you a view of how the, all of that whole flow is working in real time. So it takes out a lot of the hard plumbing and systems engineering work you need to do to create scalable data flow pipelines, and it just does that automatically for you, right? So we take that and we produce a, a parallelized pipeline for you automatically. So this is coming very soon. And uh, if you are really interested in finding out more, I would highly encourage you to go and take a look at the Google I.O. talk uh, that we did recently, which shows a demonstration of this as well. But if you're interested, go ahead and sign up uh, on online uh, at uh, developers.google.com. Go ahead and look for the sign up link. And uh, if, if, this, uh, if you're interested and we have space in our private beta program, you could actually be a part of that and test it out as well. But it just reduces the complexity around creating large-scale analytic data pipelines, right? So we looked at Google's BigQuery. We looked at how that assortment of uh, that tool could be used to query and process massive amounts of data. We looked at how that could be integrated with tools like IPython, R, etc., on the front-end side to do different kinds of analysis. But at the same time, there are also all other kinds of uh, open source data. And they're open source tools, and they run quite well on the Google Compute Engine as well. The most common one is around the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, so basically, we allow you to scale the computation and the storage side of things independently of each other. And we, you, so you get a fair amount of flexibility on the infrastructure side of things. And as far as the interoperability between cloud storage, compute engine, BigQuery, and Hadoop, all of these different services are fundamentally providing Hadoop connectors. For example, our cloud storage is HDFS compliant. So you could basically have cloud storage as a HDFS source and sync. And all of these different tools deployed on compute engine can just point and take data out of cloud storage by using HDFS as the wire protocol, right? And that makes things so much simpler because then you don't have to worry about creating uh, your own uh, your own persistence or storage cluster, et cetera. You could just directly read it off of cloud storage. Similarly, BigQuery has connectors by which you can connect to Hadoop as well. And that all of that makes uh, everything that much easier to handle. Uh, so cloud storage as a connector for Hadoop so you can have on Compute Engine the master node and the worker nodes. And they could have a local HDFS system, but they could basically talk uh, directly to Google Cloud Storage uh, over HDFS and get the data out as well. And how does that look like? So basically, uh, you uh, use your uh, Hadoop uh, file system uh, built-in client library, um, command line interface. So you would do Hadoop file system put a certain file, and specify the path to the cloud storage buckets. And so in this case, it's GS, double slash, GS stands for Google Cloud Storage, Hadoop Cloud Dev, blah, blah, blah. And automatically, that data uh, is put into the Google's uh, uh, bucket. And you can view that through the storage browser in your console as well. Similarly, you can basically list all of the buckets. So in this case, we're just using Google Storage Utility. Uh, to list all of the contents of that bucket as well. So it makes it that so much simpler. As you can see, it's Hadoop file system minus LS, the storage bucket name, and automatically it just works like 
it was uh, uh, HDFS compliant storage, right? So that what that affords you is basically interoperability. Uh, you have uh, HDFS is basically the default, uh, default standard. It's going to be the interface that gets into the next generation technologies. All the new higher level services like Pig, Hive, Spark, all of them support HDFS. And since GCS can speak HDFS, each of these can take advantage of that as well. Right? And what that affords for you is that the VMs can basically handle the application logic and you get a very good price to performance and not have to worry about uh, any of the plumbing yourself. Similarly, BigQuery and Data Store have connectors as well. So the Data Store has a connector to Hadoop, BigQuery has a connector to Hadoop, Cloud Storage has a connector to Hadoop as well. So if you want to use Hadoop as a way of doing things and want to connect to BigQuery, want to connect to the Data Store, all of those are completely possible as well. So what that gives you is an opportunity to mix and match different kinds of open source software and bring them together in the Google Cloud Platform. And we also have a bunch of different tools uh, that we have, uh, which we make it very easy to spin up large-scale Hadoop clusters. Uh, so we have a tool called BDUto, which basically wraps around the Google uh, Cloud command line tools. And it allows you to create an Hadoop cluster on demand. You can just take the script and modify it a little bit. And then now you can have the same script uh, also fire up and install R as soon on uh, each of those worker nodes and the master node as soon as it fires up as well, if you require it to work that way as well. So that will allow you to do with R with Hadoop or R with HBase and so on. Uh, and that makes it so much simpler as well. Again, this is also available, uh, so you can go ahead and play with this one as well. So uh, in conclusion, what Google BigQuery is, is that it's a very easy to use cloud analytics platform you can marry that platform to any of the uh, open source tools that you have, R, IPython, Pandas, Hadoop. And the biggest advantage is that whether you're doing interactive or batch workloads, you don't ever have to worry about how that data is stored, how, how would you scalably query that data. All of those things happen automatically for you using that same tool that Google uses to do its own analytics, right? So I think this is a good place to stop for today, and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have and talk about it in more detail. OK. OK. Uh, any questions? OK, I, I have a question. Sure. Uh, is, there, uh, I, uh, is there some native? Uh, crying for R to connect with the Google BigQuery? As of today, we don't have a native client uh, for R to connect with BigQuery. Uh, the easiest way to do it is using Python as an integration language and blend everything together through Python. But having said that, uh, do, do uh, watch out. Uh, uh, there might be things that come down the pipe. Uh, the R community and uh, ability to make R work with our analytics tools is extremely important to us. So as of today, the easiest is the way is to use Python as a way to connect these things together. OK, another question is, uh, uh, as, a, as in the example, we can see that BigQuery is a query engine to access a, a partial of big data, uh, right. and sometimes we we want to do some uh, machine machine learning uh -huh. uh, task, and uh, we need to to run some uh, some something like gradient descent or some algorithms. So could right. who, so could it run, depends yeah. how your uh, machine learning algorithm is basically split up, right? So in that case, let's say you, a lot of that data is a key and a value. In other words, uh, 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 an index and a sample, right? Yeah. This could be a time series sample or whatever else. Let's say you have a key, and then there is a value around that key which points to that particular sample which you want to put in there. First of all, Google has its own uh, machine learning tool API, which is called a prediction API. 
I didn't cover it in this talk, but I encourage you to go ahead and take a look at that. Basically, Google is exposing all of its machine learning tools as an API, and you could just basically create uh, ML models. So basically, uh, it's a classifier API, or a, I think there's time series as well, but I need to check. But what you do is to bring row column data, and one of the columns is a category field. And you specify to the prediction API what is that category field, and we'll ingest that data and automatically give you the best possible machine learning model. Internally, we'll try different models and choose the best one. Right? So in your particular case, one way of doing it is to have uh, the BD utils spin up a large cluster and have all of those observations that you want to study in data store. And uh, instead of uh, spinning up a dupe, you could basically use our deployment manager and build a cluster of uh, R-based machines very quickly. And they can all pull those observations straight out of the data store. right? Or they can try and get those observations out of BigQuery. But when you do BigQuery, it's like sampling down the data, if you will. If you want to get complete access to the, all of the raw data, you could either put all of that data in cloud storage or cloud data store. But I would say data store is probably a bit easier. And then have that pulled out from the data store and you read it natively from the data store. That's the way I would do it. OK, so you, uh, you suggest that we can run some machine learning in a Hadoop. You can run the machine learning in Hadoop. Or uh, uh, you know, I don't know how comf familiar you are with some distributed uh, paradigms like uh, Spark allows you to do some of these things in a yeah. distributed way. So, so we can also work with uh, works with Stack both with the uh, BigQuery. Uh, yeah, basically BigQuery is a HDFS compliant connector, right? So uh, you could use BDUtil to install any of those different tools like Spark and etc. Okay. Right, and then but if you want to get access to all of the raw observations, if you will. I would put all of those observations probably in Google Cloud Storage or Google Cloud Data Store or even BigQuery, depending on the use case, and use the connectors to basically pull it all into uh, the Hadoop infrastructure. So you could run Hadoop along with R, uh, or you could run Spark along with uh, uh, the uh, run a Spark cluster and have Spark talk HDFS. So since it's talking HDFS, it can directly connect to Cloud Storage or Data Store. Sorry. Directly talk HDFS to uh, the data store and pull it straight out of there as well. Okay. Is there any question? No. Okay. Yes. Thanks for talking uh, today's talk. Thank you very much, and I apologize once again for not being able to be there present. But the next time you guys have a meetup, I'll, I'll definitely be there, and we can discuss this in more detail uh, down there as well. Okay, I, I know you 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 will, uh, you will in Tai Taiwan tomorrow. Tomorrow? Yeah, and, I'm coming to Taiwan tomorrow. And uh, there is an another event in Docker Taipei. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be at the Docker Taipei event as well. Okay. So I look forward to seeing most of you there as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful evening. Okay. Take it easy. Bye. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>